subversive ideology. Dougie Fields arrived in a blaze of colour onto the 70s art scene. He's known for his very graphic imagery, his use of bright colours, and he often features limbless figures reminiscent of classical statuary, but with his own take. Early on, his work shifted between minimalism and constructivism, before turning to his signature style, what he terms post-pop figuration. Dougie's unique look has also always been deeply intertwined with his art, and I'm really excited to be here today at his London studio to hear more about his life, his work, and his very individual style. Well, it's really quite incredible to be surrounded by all of your work. It's a bit like being in Dougie's living gallery. I'm really curious to know, though, when you first started off studying architecture and then changed to studying fine art at Chelsea, how did that change come about? I started painting when I was early teens, and it was something I did every day, pretty much every day, and it was a real passion. When I started architecture school, that was mostly family pressure. And it seemed quite natural to do because you'll never make a career as an artist was the thing. Architecture was seen as much safer. And first day there, they had what's called a, a crit, where everything was put up around the room and publicly discussed by all the tutors. Mine was left to last. They rubbished everyone's absolutely rubbish difference, they were really cruel, got to me, said, this is fabulous, we really love this drawing, but it's actually useless for an architecture student, you should be at art school. And I lasted there until we had to go and design an artist's studio. And they said the most important thing to consider first was where the drains were. And I thought, I'm leaving. That was, that was it for me. Dougie's time at Chelsea School of Art saw him breaking from the constraints of the life drawing class, unleashing his own emerging style which would fuse the abstract and the figurative. His work was destined to be an expression of his own passions for life and colour, and a channel for his positivity and creative energy. So you were at Chelsea in the 60s, that must have been pretty exciting. Well, it was a brand new building that had only been built for, I think it was, I was there the third year of its existence. But then it was a very 60s purpose-designed art school with a giant Henry Moore in the forecourt. And uh, a lot of artists who were showing in galleries at the time, virtually everybody who was a name except for David Hockney, although he came and lectured there once, to a packed audience, but Alan Jones, Patrick Caulfield, John Hoyland, they were all big names in the yeah. galleries and they taught at Chelsea. So do you think your early architectural training then had an influence in your work in terms of that kind of mechanical process and being very meticulous? Oh yes, I, I still, for years I drew um, using graph paper and tracing oh. paper with a set square and a T-square and I make my pictures geometric if you look at the figures they have ruled and at some point they're straight edges outline right. they're not curvy at all when i started doing digital i found that the computer put up a grid and i was used to working on graph paper with tracing paper layers and i had layers on the computer yeah. so it was quite an easy transition so how do you think new media had an effect on your work did it change it at all yes because it allowed me to do things that I didn't dream I would ever do. As for making music, um, I love playing other people's music, and yeah. I would make medley tapes where I'd mix things. But the idea that I can actually construct something that sounds musical myself is still a revelation to me.
So I really would love to know how you came about making your own music. It seems like you've always been interested in the music scene and always kind of had it in your blood. So when did you start doing that? The first track I ever made was with a producer and um, I'd been at a party and I'd met some pop stars who were very current at the time and um, I said, oh, what are you up to? And they said, oh, we're producing it. I'd also been asked to produce a video for a TV show, a performance piece. And it all became, it became the big riddle. I am you, and you are me. Conquer divisive ideology. Dougie has produced over 30 image, sound, word, animation videos on his own YouTube channel. They incorporate montages of his own work, and not only does he create the music himself having fully embraced the new technology to produce it, but his philosophy on life, art and politics are expressed through both imagery and his spoken word. As well as being visually rich, they offer an enticing insight into his thoughts on culture, identity and the world we live in. I've noticed on your website as well, you've got an online virtual gallery. It seems yes. like you've got lots of different digital things that you're doing and well, all those little ways room of displaying sets it. On the, gallery, on yeah. the virtual gallery, I made all those and I hung all those paintings on the walls as if they were in proportion. So, so it's like a curated the, exhibition? Yes, yes. But except all those images have been redrawn digitally. They, I would say 95% of them done. So it's the paintings that were done on canvas I've remade them digitally and hung them on a wall in proportion in a little room. It's like That's you're already an, looking to the future of the art world. Well, that was an enormous lot of work to do, but it was very, a very creative thing to be yeah. doing. You know. yeah. um, I really enjoyed that. I enjoy working in the, the virtual space as much as I enjoy working in the, the real physical space. So that was unexpected. I guess it also means your work can be reproduced quite easily. How do you feel about that kind of spread online and different image sharing sites? Well, I, I learned a long time ago that the minute something was reproduced in a magazine, mm. that it was copyable and um, that one had to take it as um, a form of flattery and also for a, a sort of that the work has a life, yeah. that uh, you make it, it goes into the world or not, and you don't know what happens to it. I mean, I've, seen um, my work appear in the oddest places and mm. been told it's appeared in the oddest places but for a long time before we had the internet um, and that was always fascinating where it would turn up. I know that in the 80s seems like you were mixing with a lot of really interesting people like Andrew Logan and Sandra Rhodes. Do you think that that scene influenced your work and those people around you? Oh I think they nurtured me and sustain me. I mean, one's friends have a huge effect on one's life and there's a period in life where you're forming yourself too and the people around you help you form yourself and vice versa too. You know, it's an interplay. So I've noticed from looking around that you seem to use a lot of your friends in your work but you give them a kind of classicism, almost like an iconic status. What imagery do you think initially influenced your work? Well, my earliest passion was comics. I was a big comic reader from very young, and in the 60s I had a huge comic collection. Got into experimenting with paint in my teens, and I used to go outside and have the paint, well, the surface on the ground, and I would pour paint and let the wind blow the paint onto the canvas, and uh, drop it from different heights, and it was that was my yeah. world for a while. Then I gradually got more conceptual and it got more and more involved until I started seeing figurative elements. And I thought, I don't want to. It's supposed to be abstract. I'm not right. supposed to be seeing figures in these pictures. And then one day I'm, I actually remember the transition was I had a Donald Duck little pin of Donald Duck and I stuck it in the middle of this five foot minimal canvas and suddenly it transformed it. That made my leap into figuration. Dougie's audacious disregard for the popular abstraction of the time was marked by the addition of Donald Duck to an otherwise abstract painting. This saw Dougie's break from the aesthetic of abstraction to the beginning of his own unique style of figurative representation, 
a style he would term post-pop figuration. This inclusion of iconic imagery foretold his development as an artist who would regularly revisit the icons of his childhood and his own aesthetic development. From comics to classicism, renaissance to constructivism, and surrealism to celebrity. His icons include subjects as diverse as the Virgin Mary, Venus, and Marilyn Monroe. Well, I noticed that recently you walked in a Comme des Garçons fashion show and Andrew Logan was walking in there yes. too. Um, and there were even outfits that were... I would say they, they chose four English men yeah. who they liked the style of. Well, they based a section of the collection on each of us. So we were each followed by a group of models dressed in the style of. Yeah, well, that's something I definitely wanted to ask you about. That's your own personal style. I mean, I think that show probably proves that people do see you as a style icon. Can you tell me a bit about how, how you dress? And I noticed that you seem to only wear white trainers. I tend to only wear white trainers and white shirts. It's white at the top and white at the bottom. And it seems you wear a lot of your own artworks as well. I've always liked little accessories that change the way the outfit is from I suppose with the men you start off with cufflinks and ties and tie pins but they weren't mine then badges and they weren't mine so I started making things yeah. and making my own little things to wear. I've noticed as well that you've been um, quite a face for the Save Our's Court campaign um, and you've been getting involved in different campaigns around this area how did you get interested in that and start doing that? Oh, okay, well, I've lived here for a long time. Yeah. But I visited the exhibition centre in my childhood too. So the minute I heard it was being demolished, I started, I actually put up a petition. I did a big painting of it. Yeah, I noticed. You've done a painting of the surface. I allowed the campaign yeah. to use that. Mm -hmm. I even did an interview today that's going on ITV, I think. There was a little demonstration which I went to. <laughs> huge cultural venue that I've been personally visiting for over 50 years now. I've been to concerts and countless exhibitions. So with all of this talk of Earl's Court earlier and yes. new media, um, I've been following your series on Twitter and Facebook just around the corner where you take pictures on your phone around Earl's Court. Tell me about that series and how you started doing that. It just became something that I did about the same time I got into Facebook and I started posting them on Facebook and using Facebook as a visual diary. And then people's feedback encouraged me to carry on. And the just around the corner was literally a description. I was taking mostly pictures just around the corner. I'd walk around the corner and say, let's take a picture. And that became a thing. And now I get approached by strangers going just around the corner. What are you doing here? You're not in your local sometimes. So I'm across London somewhere. Are you still painting or are you mostly doing digital pieces? Okay, right now I'm waiting for a new canvas. It's ordered. I've got the main idea for what I'm doing in my head. I've got studies for it. I would say three quarter done. Not. I would like to start the canvas. I never start the canvas until I know pretty much 100% or 90% what's going on it because the way I paint, if I change my mind, it interferes with the actual surface of the image. So I make lots of decisions beforehand. Now I do it digitally. Before I used to do it tracing paper and graph paper and a colour study. I do all that on computer now. So I'm pretty ready for the canvas to arrive. I wanted to ask you as well about colours. You mentioned colours. This is quite a specific question, I guess. Are there any certain colours that you always use in your work or maybe that you never use? Or what do you tend to go for? I don't think there's any colour I never use. Um, I have a palette, I guess, that tends to be um, primaries, but then I like a lot of grey too. So um, there's always black, there's always white, nearly always white. So when you're trying to think of ideas for new concepts and new paintings, what would you say influences your next idea? It's always a reaction to or a development from what I've just done. But the actual act of doing is very seductive and very absorbing and very rewarding. I can't think of anything better. 
Well, on this thought of coming up with ideas then and, and how you work and your, your working process, I was wondering if you have any kind of advice um, for young artists starting out these days. I mean, I know obviously the art market and the art scene is very different now to how it was and it's constantly changing. Don't think about it. It's my first bit of advice. Think about what you enjoy doing most and how to keep yourself in touch with that. Then you've got to survive in the external world, yes. But really, it's how to keep your internal focus. That's the toughest bit. And that's the most rewarding bit.